Hello and welcome to our new podcast, Performance People, with me, Georgie. And me, Ben. This podcast is all about people who know about performance. We're going to talk to some of the best at sport, business, entertainment and politics. And chat to those who have been on a journey to the top with them. You can follow Performance People on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts or on our new Ainsley and Ainsley social channels. For now, though, enjoy this week's episode. Joining us on today's Performance People are a father and son double act who've been disrupting the world of sport for nearly 50 years. Barry Hearn is the founder and now president of Matchroom. He built a business transforming sports like boxing, snooker, fishing and darts. Barry's joined by his son, Eddie, who's now chairman of Matchroom. With over a million followers on Instagram, he's as big a draw as some of the fighters that he promotes. He's also built a reputation as the ultimate business operator. This pair are disruptors, innovators and non-conformers. But above all, they're performance people. We don't operate in a business that's dangerous, but we just operate in one where you've got to sleep with one eye open. The aggravations of boxing are a hundred times more aggravation than any other sport. I want to be better than him all the time in everything from table tennis to consolidated balance sheets. So guys, I want to start by um, quoting Mike Tyson, <laughs> who once upon a time said that everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And you two will be familiar with that. So I wanted to ask how life's plan is going for you guys at the moment. Barry, how is life post-retirement? It's really tough, Georgie, to be honest with you. I'm not looking for sympathy, but if there's any going, I'll take it. I'm finding it extremely difficult to retire. I mean, Eddie wants me out of the office and, you know, he's quite capable of running the business better than me, I know. But when you've been doing something for 45 years, it, it no, it's uh, it's like coming off some you know substance or something. It takes time to wean you off it. So I'm enjoying my life. I'm playing lots of sport and uh, trying to avoid too many injuries. I'm fishing, golf, cricket, gym, exercise. But I still love the business. I love this business. I love putting together events where everyone ends up with a smile on their face. I like seeing people change their lives because that's what the essence of sport is all about. And it obviously has to be financially sustainable. So that in itself is a battle. So it's, uh, it, I don't think I'm going to have any really massive changes in my life. I'm just going to carry on swinging it like I've always done. You know? Eddie, I can't think of anything worse than working with my dad. You both know my dad, so you'll know why I say such a thing. But I really can't think of anything worse than that. <laughs> how, how, how have the years been for you working alongside, alongside your dear father? Um, fun, really. I mean, we, we, we're almost like competitors rather than sort of colleagues or father and son where, you know, I'll sell out Wembley Stadium with some boxing and he'll tell me the viewing figures for the darts and say, well, you can't, you know, you're, you're not hitting those numbers. I said, well, you're not selling as many tickets. And like, you find yourself sort of squabbling between each other when really, I guess you should be on the same team. But, um, it's, it's always really been a lifestyle, to be honest with you, more than anything. Like if, if you knew anything about, the family it's it's all we talk about at home it's all we talk about around sunday lunch is our events our business our numbers you know and it's it's always been very natural uh to us it, it, he says he's retired i mean he just this is my office which was his office which used to be our lounge in, in the family home and he just strolls in you know i mean earlier on i was doing a big interview on eubank ben and he just opened the door Hello, what's going on in here then? Like actually mid-interview, you know. So, but I suppose he he can't keep his, him out. So we'll let he him can't off. Keep him Does out. that remind yeah, you of you and my dad? You definitely can't Does. keep him out. <laughs> no. But was that was that always the plan? Was that always the the vision, Barry? That you know, Eddie. It was always you, the Eddie plan. I mean, I, I I think I offended Eddie once when I described him not as my son but as my project. <laughs> uh, if you understand the way we work, everything is a game. So we don't take ourselves too seriously. We work prodigious hours that other people can't keep up with us. So we're very, very difficult as a family to be. And although Eddie's an entirely different person to me and has grown up in a different environment than I did, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And, you know, when I listen to him speak or I watch how he does things, most of the time I say, you know, that's exactly what I would do. And there are times when he does things that I don't recognise, and that's because 
he's taken most of the business to another level in terms of modern day techniques and more digital social media appliances that were beyond me in my early days. I'm, I'm coming to terms with them. But it is a different world. But what hasn't changed is just basic competition. I want to be better than him all the time in everything from table tennis to consolidated balance sheets. So and everything in between we compete on. But at the end of the day, you know, he's also probably my best mate because I've got more in common with him and we're on a common journey and we're changing people's lives, including our own lives, and the legacy we leave will be what we leave behind. So, you know, we don't take ourselves too seriously. God has smiled on us as a family. We do very well and we don't really give a shit about anything else, you know? <laughs> Eddie, kids of oh, successful parents. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. you can say what you like. Kids of successful parents, Eddie, don't often have this crazy ambition that you have. It just doesn't necessarily always translate. Where do you think that comes from? I guess if, if you're an ambitious person, you want to achieve in your own right, really. And, and that's probably, I always joke about it. I've just been filming with Tony Bellew and he always winds me up when he comes to the office and we're just driving around Brentwood and he was sort of said, oh, you had it tough, you did, lad. You know, I was like, I guess the, only, the struggle that you have coming from a successful parent or a successful family is being respected within your own right. I think that's that's the only struggle, really, you can have. Yeah, there's a mental struggle, emotional struggle, everything else that seems to be a talking point these days. But really, you know, if you're an ambitious person, you don't really want to be Barry Hearn's son. And when I was growing up, that's all I was, really, and I couldn't wait to tell people quick enough. If I was at a show, oh, do you know Barry Hearn? That's my dad. You know, and um, I guess... I see a common denominator in that with a few people that I spoke to. I do, you know, that the podcast with the BBC as well. And when I was, had Frank Lampard on, it's quite similar. He was at the year above, he was in the year above me at my school, our school. And he was always Frank Lampard seniors, boy, little Frank, you know, young Frank. And when he got into West Ham, he used to work very hard. His dad would have him over the fields after school with the cones. And just, I used to watch him, you know, as I'd leave. Oh, there's Frank over there. Look, what's he doing? And when he got into West Ham, it was just because he was Frank's son, apparently. And he should never have been there. They should never have gave him the contract and went on to be one of the greatest England footballers of all time. And also Frank Lampard Sr. went on to be Frank Lampard Jr.'s dad, what he was known as. And even with Connor Ben and Chris Eubank and people like that, same kind of thing. I think you, you just, if, you, if you're a winner, if you're competitive, you want to be better than everyone and, and the bar was set by him and the only way I can really be recognised as and respected as someone that's a good operator is to be as good or better than him. So mm. the drive, I've always been like that, you know, and it's funny because at school I wasn't, you know, I didn't work hard at all really. I, I got kicked out of Brentwood school after my GCSEs and they sent me to some, well, because I could only get into some dodgy college sort of on the, the borders of East London. And it was really, it was that moment really where they kind of like, everyone that I knew that went there just didn't bother going to the classes and just sat downstairs in the canteen. And I said to the teacher, what happens if you don't come to the lessons? And he went, oh, nothing, it's up to you, isn't it? You can even, you know, you, you, so obviously you won't get your grades, but nothing we can do about it. And I thought, wow. Oh. Whereas at school, I was always fighting against, you know, like I would be, one weekend I'd be at Eubank Ben at Old Trafford walking around, you know, and then next weekend I've got this maths teacher telling me off. And it's a terrible attitude to have. But to me, it was like, who are you? Like, what are you telling me off? Like, I've just been to, you know, I, I know you, Bank, and I know Ben, and I'm my dad's Barry Hearn. And it was horrible looking back. It's embarrassing. But that's what I was like <laughs> as a kid. And going to college kind of just changed your perception a little bit. Of, and I don't know what flick, because I've always I've been, I've got a sick mentality at work. Sick. Like my friends will say to me, you're ill. You are <laughs> ill. But I've never, and it, we used to go out, even when I was, when, before I was at Matrim and I was working, you know, in sports sponsorship or, or athlete management, I would go out till three or four in the morning, six o'clock, I'd be on the road up the M6 and there's just, but I don't know, I don't really know where that's come from, really. Just, I, I know the only way I can describe it is just in a drive to, to achieve in my own name. Yeah. But, but I mean, Barry, the, I mean, the business is now phenomenally successful, but I bet, you know, back in the day, and Eddie, when you were a nipper 
seeing all this unfold, there must have been mm. some tough times. I think the difference is with us is because we are, I mean, it sounds terrible, you know, I think we're very proud still to have that working class mentality in us that when there's a tough moment, that's a tough moment for you to resolve and not to involve anybody else. You know, I, we don't look for favours or handouts or gifts. We don't expect them and we've never been disappointed. We don't get them. But when it was tough times, when Eddie was growing up, he, no one knew other than me because it wasn't their business. It was my business to solve things. And Eddie today, you know, he, I mean, I wouldn't want his life, to be honest. I think I, I'm capable of a great work ethic myself, but he is literally disappearing every day. But I don't expect him, I don't expect him to moan because that's the life we've chosen. We've been blessed to enjoy the benefits. And as always, there's always a price to pay. People don't see that. The man in the street always looks, oh, you earn, you know, you make a nice few quid. They say, yeah, we work 17 hour days. How are you doing enjoying your weekends? <laughs> you know, we haven't seen a weekend. Or uh, are you watching your, I mean, I didn't play too much with Eddie when he was younger. I play a lot more with his children, you know, but. There's a price to pay. It's not all pluses. And there's no point in moaning when you have a tough, tip, you know, a tough time. That goes with the course. It's like you, Ben, you know. I'm sure you've had races where things haven't gone your way, but you're not going to get anywhere crying about it, are you? <laughs> and you're not actually going to get anywhere going home and saying, oh, you know, Georgie, I had this terrible wave today and it came <laughs> just when I wasn't expecting. It's like boring. Get on with it. Yeah. Do your job. Shut up fix it you know I gotta, that's I gotta, what I, I gotta, say to him Barry all the time Go, come on get on with it fix gotta, it gotta solve work. it no get but on with yeah. my uh I mean I had a great relationship with my dad too and similar to your relationship and yeah, that, yeah. for me to have a sort of almost a mentor like that I'm sure it's a, it sounds very similar to your relationships that you know but you don't actually ask for it though, no. do you yeah but you learn by being around Mm. You know, I mean, Eddie, yeah. I don't know how many nights after nights he stood. Well, I was on the phone rowing with Don King or Bob Arum or Frank Warren or someone, and he's just on my shoulder, not saying anything. But I got the feeling during those informative years that he was absorbing. And now I listen to him and I think, you know, he, he may well have, I'm going to be big headed and say, he may have learned at the feet of a master, <laughs> but then he's taken it to his own level. And and that's the job. You know, dads want their sons to be happy. We all want to help our kids, don't we? It's natural. We want them to be the best they can be, and we want to help them as much as we can. But there comes a certain time where the child says, okay, dad, thanks for that. I'm off now, and I'm doing it my way. And he does loads of things that I think, oh, what is he doing? 99 out of 100 of them work out. So it makes him right and me wrong, and he's found his own level. Eddie, do you remember those moments where you'd kind of listen in to various conversations that Barry was having and, and sort of without realising it at the time, you would have been sort of paving your way to the future? Yeah, I mean, even people who I work with now, I remember that we had two phones in the house. One was like the family phone and the other one was a voicemail, was just an answer phone that he would pick up if it was someone important as they were leaving a message. And... All some of the people I deal with now, I remember hearing them night after night on the voicemail, you know, of this phone in, in, the, in the lounge. So I would just sit in the office and, you know, to be fair, you know, when he was around, he would come back and we would play cricket in the garden or we'd have a game of football or whatever it would be. But then generally by sort of seven o'clock, it was him in the office and me sort of laying on the floor, just throwing a cricket ball in the air or, you know, messing around with a football and listening. He was, um, he had a terrible uh, sort of not, not really temper, but when he was working in boxing, and I, I, I appreciate it now because he's changed so much since he moved away from boxing because the aggravations of boxing are a hundred times more aggravation than any other sport or any other business. Why is and that? He was, is when that? he was working in boxing, just because you're dealing with dishonorable people, really. You're, dis you're dealing with people that generally you can't trust um, it's a hugely money money motivated industry because it's prize fighting, and and you know some of that you can understand because of, of the nature of the sport. There's no barriers to entry and entry in, in boxing, so literally you two could 
finish this podcast and go, you know, I think we're going to start a boxing management company and start advising fighters. The next thing, I'm negotiating with you who have never been involved in a fight before in your life who thinks this fighter should be getting 10 million. And you're, you know, and it, it's... Sounds it's, good. It's a madness sign up to industry. That. <laughs> it's hugely... A, yeah, yeah, you're probably, probably yeah, giving you ideas. But it's a hugely um, addictive industry at the same time. He did it really... I mean, a lot of the people that he used to argue with every night are still going and are, are so bitter. I mean, I listened to their interviews. Bob Arum's 91. Now, Frank Warren's now in his 70s. Like, he's... It's... I just look at it. I went, no way for me. No way. Because when you talk about the sacrifices, the sacrifices that I've given over the last 12 or 13 years, again, to the man on the street, don't really see it. But like life-shortening sacrifices, basically, is the truth of it. So you need to know when to go. And he did it at a great time. So have you got a moral sort of code that you live by? at Matchroom because like mm. you just said you're negotiating with all sorts of different characters from all sorts of different backgrounds and you know with different interests um, so do you have a sort of a moral code that you as a family firm sort of live by in terms of who you will or won't talk to well, or how those discussions we do, go we do but that moral code changes on circumstance to be fair I mean when I first started off my moral code probably wasn't as strong as it is now I'm a really nice person now I'm lovely I wasn't lovely when I was younger because we were fighting for survival, fighting to build a business in a dirty world. And frankly, you had to stand your corner and you had to make sure that people respected you, you know. Uh, nowadays, because we are, we're in this, we're actually, sadly, we're part of the establishment. We're a major global company, arguably one of the biggest in the world in what we do. We have significant profits significant cash reserves. So, you know, we can afford to be honest is what I'm saying. So our moral code today, which Eddie embraces completely, is tell the truth. Your handshake is better than any contract. Always look in people's eyes, never talk behind their back. So that's basically what we do. But we have the independence to do that that doesn't exist for a lot of people Mm. and maybe didn't exist when I was younger either. It's funny, isn't it, that? Because that's very old-fashioned. I know. Well, I'm old-fashioned, but I still like to afford to be old-fashioned. You know, if you're fighting, if you're fighting in this type of business when you first start up or when you've got problems or when people are being disloyal, dishonest, violent, whatever, you, you, you've got to make a decision. Do you want to be in this game or not? And as Eddie said, you know, it is the most exciting game in the world when it all comes together. There is nothing like it. I mean, again, Ben, I don't want to put you in the spot, but, you know, when you're in a really big race and it's close and and you're really relying on everything you've brought up and you're learning and you, you're finding out about yourself, aren't you, more than anybody else, you dig in there and you find out, what am I really like? Do I roll over? Do I, hell, roll over? You know, that's the attitude winners have. And we're winners. So we compete everything, every business we have, which is a lot these days, is run like a sporting contest. We prepare diligently. We're born to do what we do, and we want to win at all costs within the rules. And that's, that's a luxury. You know, what, it's beautiful now. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm terrible because I just love telling the truth to everybody because it's an independence that sometimes you don't get. You know, and and it really upsets what's, what's a lot. The fam- of what's the famous quote? If you tell the truth, you never have to remember what you said. I think that's, that's a great quote. <laughs> that's right. Ain't that the truth? Uh, at my age, yeah. that's that's a real benefit yeah. when you get older as well. Because <laughs> you can't remember lies. You know, you can remember Love the it. truth; it comes naturally. But yeah, it, it, it is so much that, that feeling of being yourself and being able to just say, "Look, son, this is how it is." Is something that Eddie's picked up and taken on. And and you'll lose you'll lose people by it because some people don't want the truth. Some people don't want honesty. Funny enough, but it, it makes you feel a better person. And as I say, it's a lot easier to remember what you said if you tell the truth. Have either of you ever been worried though, ever that you're going to put yourselves in danger? I mean, we're talking about this sort of you know balls out, tell the truth attitude, and you're dealing with some pretty interesting characters. Have you ever worried at all that it's going to backfire in some awful way? Well, I think the danger now is more like 
a corporate danger mm. of him just saying what he thinks. And we live in a world now, actually, where, <laughs> you know, over the years, things have changed. I mean, I now, you know, I, I've always been conscious of his sort of truthful nature at this stage of his life, where literally he'll say whatever he wants. And some of it's usually controversial. Some of it can be, in today's world, very controversial. Mm. But even now, even with my, you know, with, in my era, it's changed again a level beyond that. So really in, in the world we live, I mean, we don't, we don't operate in a business that's dangerous, but we just operate in one where you've got to sleep with one eye open. Mm. Not, not for any danger, but because of the, the way people conduct business and their integrity. So I think, you know, that the danger now of telling the truth is you're bound to upset someone along the way, you know, and uh, some people don't care about that, but there's, there's one of them. I think a lot of people look at the boxing business wrongly and they just assume that everybody's gangsters and it's physical danger is what you're talking about, really. Um, and it actually, it couldn't be further from the truth because people are so involved with boxing, you know, it changes lives, the areas they come from. Poor people can't be professional fighters. You just, you just, no chance. You know, Eddie was decent, but he, he couldn't possibly be of any good because who wants to get hit in the face all the time when you're practicing even, you know? But what you do find is that the people, the dangerous people today are lawyers and accountants, as the world always intended. You know, they're much more dangerous than gangsters. I wanted to talk about being a promoter and life as a promoter. I kind of feel like you two are sort of the... I don't know. You're like our version of Jerry Maguire. I'm trying to think of like what you know of, of someone that we I can relate you were to. Say Laurel and Hardy, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> no, but there, there's definitely sort of this Jerry Maguire "show me the money" thing going on. I mean, what do you look for in a future star? What are the ingredients that you need to be able to work with to take someone to the top? Well, from my point of view, I mean, I, again, all depends. I mean, the, the famous Jerry Maguire scene was when he he left the company, had lost all his clients and was desperate to hold on to a client. In our position where we can be extremely selective, it's more about personal feeling than the feeling of how a fighter might be valued commercially. So for me, it's when I meet someone and when you can have a relationship that you can truly enjoy the journey of. I mean, I, you know, Anthony Joshua is a good example because – we knew him before he won gold in the Olympics and we knew his story and his background and we wanted to be a part of that journey. Again, people, especially young people today, they see the result, but they don't understand the process. And that is a good example there of someone, yeah, he's got this and he's got that. Yeah, but you didn't see, you know, when he got robbed in the finals of the World Amateur Championship or you didn't see where... He got arrested, you know, and he was on trial and he went to prison. You know, you didn't see when he used to have to get the bus some way up to Sheffield from North London to even attend, you know, GB training or before that, you know, when, he's, when he came, to, he was in the UK. And like, the, there's a whole story to be told about how someone got there. And for me, when we're talking about working with athletes now, personally, it's more about if I just connect with someone, they've got to have ability. They've got to have marketability. You know, they've got to have a story if they really want to be a, a major name. But generally, someone who you'll meet, again, Katie Taylor, another great example, mm. you know, reached out to us and sort of said, look, I'd like to change professional women's boxing forever. I thought, I'll have a meeting with you, but let's be honest, women's professional boxing, where's that going? Five minutes, one of the most inspirational people I've ever met. And, and from then, you're invested in that journey as well. And it's not just a case of being a client. You want to provide the opportunities for them to succeed. And the story with her, again, like you talk about the process of, of a Katie Taylor who used to walk through the gym in Bray with her head, with her hair in a ponytail under her head guard to pretend she was a boy, to go into amateur tournaments, to even be allowed to box, mm. to selling out Madison Square Garden and making seven figures in the process. That's what, you know, that, that, that bit in the middle, young people today really don't understand that bit because we live in a, a digital and social media society where everybody sees, you know, the championship belts or the house or the cars or, or whatever it's going to be, but don't understand the process to get there. 
How do you I think find the that? For us is that yeah. We actually we actually fall in love with our clients. This is a, this is a good thing and a bad thing. But you get so close to the people that that you really share that journey with. You get to the stage where you'd take a bullet for them. You know, they're like family. I mean, Joshua is. I mean, he's been beat three of his last four fights, mm. five. Uh, five fights, but he's like family to us. Katie Taylor, you know, if I had a, another daughter, I would want her to be like Katie Taylor. But this is much closer than just, you know, you're not just buying a product and enhancing it and selling it on. And that's a bit, that's vulgar in comparison to the journey we have. And that means their ups and downs are much wider. You know, the difference between them is, is it grows all the time because we are invested not just a monetary investment, you know, we're invested in the principle of not just that person, but the message that story sends out to the other kids out there where there may be barriers for entry for them in their profession, where they have to believe that they're special, but they do need a hand along the way. And uh, that's what we try and do. You can't do it with everybody. And, and ability is a massive part of that success process. You know? How do you tap into that? Talent pool, do you, do you find now that they're just coming to you or do you have some scouts out there? How do you try and identify these youngsters? I think a bit of both, really. I mean, Eddie on the boxing side is, you know, I'm, I'm biased, but obviously if I was a young fighter, the one person in the world I would want to look after me would be Eddie Hearn. He's got the power, he's got the platforms, he's got the exposure and he's got the money. I mean, they're four really good things to have on your side. I mean, but at the same time, because people like me are anoraks, I analyze everybody's data. So I know that if there's a kid coming out in, I've got one at the moment in Belfast I'm watching all the time. He's 19 yeah. years old. He works in a chicken factory. I think he's <laughs> going to be one of the great darts players in five years' right. time. I might be wrong, but I think he will. And Snook are the same. You know, you, we're results driven. I mean, Eddie's signs lots and lots of fighters. But those fighters he's signed have established a pedigree that he's been watching through the amateur game or wherever, you know. So that money ball, Billy Bean approach, it, that's more you, is it, Barry? That's that's where you're into the stats. and Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm into the stats of, because that people will tell you lies all the time. That's natural, isn't it? But numbers don't lie. It's how you interpret numbers and how you take advantage of those numbers is the defining factor on success or failure. You still need that little tiny bit of magic that nothing really transcribes or you, you need that one bit of luck or that one moment where you make a breakthrough moment. I mean, when Davis won the World Snooker Championship in 81, I was telling everyone for years he was the best thing in the world. I didn't know what I was talking about. Yeah. It was probably more bullshit than anything else. And all of a sudden, he pots a few balls and I think, bloody hell. He is the best player in the world. I was more shocked than anybody else. <laughs> but the fact is that we'd identified him, we'd established a relationship, we cared about his future, and we cared about what he could add to our business. We're not angels. We're not sponsors. We're in business to create a sustainable business that can produce results, create entertainment for everyone, and change lives. That sounds a sweeping statement, but that's, that's the big picture of where you're trying to get to. And sometimes you'll fail. Sometimes people will disappoint you, you know. And, and you have changed lives. You've changed loads of lives. But how, how does that? So you, you get this kid, you know that they're going to be the next big thing. You take them to the stratosphere and launch them on the global stage. How do you make sure that they're going to be okay with what comes next? Because it's big, big time fame, it's, isn't it? After tough. that, You can't, you can't. Yeah, you can't make sure because... Sometimes you're reliant on the intelligence of the athlete and sometimes that falls well short of where you'd rather they were. You have to look where they come from. Mm. Why should they know? How can someone know easily how to deal with changing fortunes, for example? How do they know to differentiate between good advice and bad advice? The man that puts his arm around you and says, let me look after your son. You know, are they looking at the right? Are they looking at the right person? It's education by association more than anything else. And then you keep your fingers crossed because it can all go terribly wrong. Some people, mm. and I'll tell you, Anthony Joshua is another good example. They study business. They actually try to understand the thing. They they talk to everybody to get a good, the best advice, and then they go away and can make up their own mind. 
but it's it's we can we can help them, but we're not the final answer. We're not financial consultants. We're more consultants than life. Eddie, that fight with Joshua, where he stood up on the stage afterwards and he start he started speaking. Um, what what did you make of that? And what did you say afterwards to him? Um, it feels like we got a bit of a snapshot there of the, the pressure that he's putting on himself and the emotions obviously riding high. How do you kind of manage that roller coaster of emotions that takes place for somebody like that at that place in his career? Well, I think people don't understand the sort of microscope that you you live under when you're you have a profile like Anthony Joshua. Mm. I mean. My profile is a thousandth of Anthony Joshua, yet I'll still be in any restaurant, in any shop with my kids, walking down any street, and people are coming over wanting to talk about AJ against Fury or a photo or one of the memes that they've seen of me. And like it again, I'm my profile is minuscule compared to Anthony Joshua. So imagine being just a normal kid right, from a, a normal background, wasn't born into this life. And all of a sudden, all the things that you love doing, going to the park with your mates for a game of football, going over the fields on your quad bike, going for a coffee, going to the shop, playing a bit of FIFA, you can no longer do. So your life revolves around being an ambassador and trying to be a positive role model for the next generation and training every single day. So when you get beaten, your world comes crumbling down. And then 11 months of training and living in that microscope and not going out and training and going back to a little apartment in Loughborough with your team and going to bed and waking up and, you know, going to do your run and then coming back for sleep and going to bed and then get for 11. And then when you do go out, as you'd have seen a couple of months prior to the fight, he got abused out the window by a load of students. Now chose to go up to that dorm and have a little quiet word with them and they'll never do it again. But again, it just gives you an example of when you step out of that world, the pressure's on top of you because it's never ending. So again, you, you put all that work in in the gym, but you can never have your time to unravel or relax. Or you know, A lot of people say to me, what do you do to relax? It's quite a strange question to me. And I go work <laughs> like I, I literally don't have anything that i relax for and that's the same for anthony joshua and i think when you put that pressure on yourself sooner or later when you want it so bad and you get beaten that that was the thing for him what you saw was a frustrated athlete that spent 11 months of his life gearing up to win a fight that he'd lost and wasn't able to do it and i think the cracks what you saw at the press conference which was ultimately a of a breakdown into tears was this is too much and I can't keep living with this pressure on my shoulders of being the guy who pops to get his petrol and then ends up doing 20 minutes of photos which he will right he won't get back in the car and say no sorry he'll stay for half an hour then he'll go and talk to the, the, the lady in the petrol shop like about something for, because that's him and it's just pressure pressure Pressure, pressure. It, that night was a little bit like, you know, a, a tin can. And you know when you just lift, lift the lid off and it just shh, you hear that noise? Mm. That was, And I think that was a good thing for him, a really good thing, because people got to see the pressures of that's on Anthony Joshua's shoulders and saw the real Anthony Joshua. I've never seen him cry. I've never seen him close to crying. And it happened in front of the world. In, in fact, he's the one person that you'd – least expect to do that he's the guy that would go come on what's the matter with you don't be like that let's go and the energy that he has and just probably over those last year or so you just see that energy just sapped out of him you know and i think so, that, that's the pressures that he's been under is this a bit of a reset for him do you think like you say it's a good thing get that out there and he can now yeah i think so i think you know, the belts have gone Right, so you know when you when you've got those world championship belts, you're a target. The governing bodies are putting mandatories on you, mandatory defences, telling you to fight. You've got to pay that sanctioning fee, that sanctioning fee. It's like it's like a never-ending pressure. Now you can just sit back and say, let's just revert. I'm sure you've had it, Ben. You know the the way you felt when it was just sport, right? When you know it wasn't about the teams, it wasn't about sponsorship or the deals, or it was just. 
when kids play sport, it's one of the most beautiful things to watch, isn't it? Because it's like they have absolutely no knowledge or interest about they don't want to get paid. Do they? Right? They don't. They're not looking at a sponsorship. You haven't met our daughter. Agents all around them asking. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Well, look, but but that's sometimes. We actually say about what you do to relax. That's one of my therapies. Is watching my kids play sport because that's when you remember actually what it is. And the problem with professional sports, but football's a great example now. The top level, it's just a business. I mean, you talk about boxing being a dirty business. My God, football times it by fifty compared to boxing. I mean, that is as, as cutthroat as you will get. We had players at Leighton Orient Football Club getting signed up by Premier League clubs at 9, 10, 11 years old. You never even see them again. They're going for six figures at that age. And it's just, they're, they're just washed into a system, you know? So I think at that point, you have to revert back to sport and what it is. You have to start enjoying it again. You know, not doing it because people expect you to do it or doing it because there's a big deal on the table. or do, You have to enjoy it. And I think, Anthony perhaps started not to enjoy it anymore because of everything that came with it. When he started boxing, he didn't do it because he wanted to make millions and win world championship belts. It took him away from the problems in his life. It gave him discipline, respect, manners, gave him a regimental lifestyle to change his mindset in life. Just so happens he was good. But he never asked for this world. It just came with the success that that he generated. And I think now you just got to revert back to saying, pressure's off, you know, public, expect me to lose. Because when he lost to Andy Ruiz, it was like, oh, he's useless. You know, that's that's the classic British public where you've got this young kid, won gold in the Olympics, went on, beat Klitschko, won the world titles, unified the division. Wow, gets beat. Oh, he's rubbish. He was, he's just a hype job anyway. You know, and, and, it, and that, that feeling of, you know, on the way up, that amazing feeling of being lifted by the public, and then all of a sudden you open the paper and, we're and quite it's like, good at that in Britain, Joshua's aren't we? a joke. Oh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Andy Murray is probably the great example yes. of, you know, and Frank Bruno, the same. Oh, Frank, we love Frank because he's actually not very good, is he? You know, but he's the British hero. And then he wins a world title and it's like, well, who Do did know, he win to win a world title? You know, title? They, used to, they used to boo Steve Davis into the arena. <laughs> and Steve used to turn around to me and say, why are they booing me? What have I done? <laughs> I said, you win everything, son. I yeah, said, you've got, you've you got effectively uh, boring. That's how they view it. It's yeah, effectively yeah. And dull. Then, and when he started losing, suddenly he just became the most popular person ever. And it was just, listen, you've just got to ignore that. This is where it comes down to what's inside you as an athlete, you know. You've but that's what I love. Sure that's what you- I love about this because this, this, the only thing that is, and I know it's terrible when the British media slam someone for just being brilliant at what they do, but then when it does go pear shaped, there is a real opportunity there. I mean, you guys must absolutely see that for the comeback story. I mean, ultimately, everybody oh, loves an yeah. underdog and everybody loves a comeback, and that does give you, doesn't it, the ability to rework the script on it. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think coming off AJ's loss and what happened in the ring and, and particularly the press conference after, now arguably the story is more intriguing than ever. What, what happens next? They actually increased Joshua's you know, value. to be. I mean, it's not as bizarre because you say, well, he got beat. But he is definitely further ahead in international demand, in public demand. Mm-hmm. Everyone wants to watch the road to redemption, don't they? I mean, everyone wants or to implosion. see someone come back. Or implosion. The best thing you can ever do, ask Gaza, ask Tessa Sanderson, the best thing you can ever do is cry on TV. I keep telling you I'm this. I'm working on it. I keep I'm working saying on that it to with you. <laughs> ben, Ben, if you can just cry a little bit more, you're very oh, well, you're, 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 you're too cold, Ben. In, yeah. in victory. When Andy well, Murray yeah. cried can, at Wimbledon, can, he had the nation, not it. just because exactly. he'd won yeah. Wimbledon, yeah. Yeah. but because they saw the emotion and they loved it and they wanted more of it. I keep saying this to well, you. Well, I think that was that was a that, that was a Joshua moment. I think, yeah. to my mind, I agree with Eddie. I think that was the best thing that could have happened at that stage. I think it was a release for him to get his emotions out because you bottle up things. This is why my life never comes, I never feel any pressure on anything. The reason is because I don't have anything inside me. It comes out. And it, whether it's good or bad, it comes out. And I'm just myself. And I do have one thing called I go fishing. I keep trying to get Eddie to go fishing because fishing is the greatest way to just relax. No phone calls, no aggravation, no one giving you grief. 
It's you and your rod. I'm like, it's called fishing. It's not called catching. It's called fishing. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> that is entirely the problem. What sort I will of, get, what sort I will of get in there. What sort I'm, of fishing? I fish everywhere, Fly fishing? And, all over the world, Ben. Everything, everything. I'm haven't you got a record? For, right. Haven't you got a record for a fish caught in Mauritius or something? Haven't you got a record for that no, somewhere? Well, no, no, my, I mean, it depends my, what day you catch the story. My, <laughs> my main record is my, my little lake at home, which is uh, the water level's going down, so I can't wait. You've for changed, some rain. Barry. Your little lake at home. You've changed. My, uh -huh. my, I know this is not my council house in Dagenham. <laughs> no. no. But my little lake at home, there's 64 carp in it. Each one is microchipped. Each one is named. I've been fishing it for 20 years. They get a kiss and put back gently <laughs> and their weight is taken. And they're my, they're my friends. But also, I mean, I'll go off to British Columbia and fish in the wilderness for salmon and I'll go to the Caribbean and fish for my food and things like that. I just find it's very therapeutic in my life, you know, because when you spend all day like he does, actually wanting to punch someone in the face because they're getting on your nerves. It's good to pick up a fishing rod and just say, you know what, the, the, the leaves look a little darker this time of the year. Don't they? <laughs> just to finish up on the Joshua piece, not to take you away from your fishing daydream, but just to finish up on the Joshua well, piece. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's e be honest, everyone, everyone's off. always asking this question about when's the Tyson Fury you know, gig going to happen? When's that going to take place? I don't want to ask that question. I want to ask how important is it that Joshua, if he does do it, wins that one? Yeah, I mean, really, the problem with Tyson Fury is is I've never known a man just, one, change his mind, but two, also say things that he just doesn't mean. And it's only now, actually, where the public's changed a little bit recently where he's said a few things that haven't stacked up. And before, he was a, he was a, a master manipulator of the public, also with an incredible story, also a tremendous fighter. But this is also a guy that said that he was going to give his entire purse to the homeless after Deontay Wilder. And I still get people stop me in the street going, I love Fury because he gave all his money away to the homeless. <laughs> I'm thinking, he didn't give, didn't give a penny away to the homeless. It's unbelievable. But so, but at the same time, it's a fight we've always wanted. He's very difficult to beat Tyson Fury. I, I wrote him off against Klitschko. I wrote him off against Wilder. And he's come through all those fights. So it's a very difficult fight. He called out the fight now because he watched the same interview you watched after the fight and thought, wow, what a great time to fight Anthony Joshua. He dangled the bait, unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever way you look at it, Joshua took the bait and accepted the fight. Doing the deal and actually getting the ink dry is another process altogether, which he's going through at the moment. But you know, Joshua really doesn't have anything to lose at the moment. I want him to go back. I'm up for the Fury fight because I think this might be the only chance. But I also want him to go back, as we said earlier, and enjoy the sport again. Go in there, you know, fight a few top 10, top 15 guys, go and knock them out, get active. You know, because of the TV situation, because of the size of his events, he's only been boxing twice a year, sometimes less. He should be boxing four times a year, mm. you know, and, and I think he'll start enjoying the process a lot more because those long camps, those 10, 11 months between fights is just like build up of pressure, 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 the moment. You put so much focus on the moment and it's here and then it goes wrong. And it's just the world comes crumbling down. So we fancy our chances against Tyson Fury, who's a very good fighter, but, but we'll see what happens. Katie Taylor, um, I know, Eddie, that you're really passionate about what, what you guys are achieving together. Um, Barry, in terms of um, your, your take on Katie Taylor, can you ever have imagined that shortly she'll be headlining Wembley? <laughs> it's funny because I, I did a few women's fights 20 years ago. We were featuring when we had a big business in Poland going at the time and there was a couple of really top women fighters. That's the first time I saw really tough women that, that I, I don't want to say box like men because they, they just boxed, like everyone boxed. Katie Taylor is the first of the, the new breed of women boxers that taken it seriously, have had a proper amateur up, upbringing. So it's not a sex situation anymore. It's not men and women's boxing anymore. It's just boxing, which I suppose is what Katie set out to achieve on day one. And the greatest compliment to her is how the women's game has changed. Mm. The type of purses they're earning now are unbelievable to me from yesteryear. But then the world is changed all the time. Values change. The fact it comes down to when we talk about numbers don't lie. 
So I ask myself a question. No one gets a favor from me. No, you don't, you don't get favors. You earn what you get. And the numbers don't lie. So you look at ratings, you look at ticket sales, you look at sponsorship requests, and then you evaluate, irrespective of sex, color, creed, or anything, it doesn't make any difference. Is this a good business? And frankly, women's boxing is a good business. It's doing numbers. When, you know, when Katie got a seven-figure payday in Madison Square Gardens, I went to the fight. It was unbelievable atmosphere. It wasn't about two women boxing at all. It was a great sporting event. And the ratings were huge. There wasn't a ticket left in the building. And the entertainment value was off the scale. So I think probably we do wrong now to even talk about women's boxing. It's just part of boxing, and that's how it should be. But they don't get favours. They get evaluated. In our other sports, snooker and darts in particular, these are gender-neutral sports. So women can test on the same playing field as the men. In my ideal world, of course, physically that's sometimes not possible, but in an ideal world, that's the fairest solution. And the results are, and the prize money is the same, and it's results-driven as most sports are. So, you know, I think the most important thing is to give people opportunity. That's our job. We don't say who wins or loses. It's up to them, but we give Ed, them the chance. Eddie, do you ever choke up about Katie Taylor? Because I feel like her story is such an emotive one. It's so incredible. Um, you know, like you've said, the fact that she used to tuck her hair up under a head cap so that, you know, you wouldn't know that she was a boy going into train at the gym. She's deeply religious. She's quite mysterious in a way, isn't she? She doesn't do much promotion. Very. I mean, what, what's she like to sort of mm. work alongside and to manage as a person? She must be quite fascinating. Well, yeah, she sent, she sent me a message on Twitter, which I've since found out she definitely didn't write because it was <laughs> it was quite long and, you know, it was like you're the greatest promoter and I feel like with you behind me and stuff like this. She told me her brother actually wrote it. But um, I had a meeting with her just out of respect, really. I saw her win gold in, in at London and it was what, the best atmosphere of the whole Olympic Games. I mean, it was right up there with Mo Farah. Like the whole of the XL was full of Irish and she's like an icon in Ireland. So there was no I, – I found it really commercially disrespectful that broadcasters all of a sudden started investing in women's sport to tick boxes, right? And I understand the need to give female athletes opportunities, but it wasn't really that. It was just, oh, you can imagine at the top level, I mean, look, you know, you, you were a part of that, Georgie, when you were sort of leaving that world of women's sport was starting to come through. But let's be honest, commercially, it wasn't working. It wasn't rating. It actually wasn't very good, right? But it was something that people felt like we should be ticking boxes doing. Yeah. And for me, and for Katie Taylor particularly, that's completely wrong. I mean, I remember going to Katie Taylor when she started and said, look, a broadcaster wants to do a women's boxing event on International Women's Day. I thought, what a great idea. So it was going to be Katie Taylor headlining and an all-female card. She nearly chinned me. She said, <laughs> absolutely no way. I said, why? She said, because that's not what it's about. Mm. It's about us being good enough to compete on a boxing show, not you put on a boxing show full of women because that would be a good look for International Women's Day. And actually, when I thought about it, she couldn't be more right because the only way you get longevity in, in a product, and particularly in women's sport, is if it's commercially sustainable. And Katie Taylor is a proven commercial commodity that drives numbers, that puts bums on seats, and people want to tune in to watch. Not because she's it's just a woman and we should, we should support Katie Taylor because she's a woman. Because it's watchable. It's better than male boxing, a, a, a huge portion of it as well. And that's the same now with women's football. I mean, when you tune in and watch the Euros, yeah, it's nice to support the women in Europe. It was good. The quality was good. The finishing was unbelievable. You'd see a striker go through on a one-on-one. -on -one, you think, oh, what's going to happen here? You know, chips it over, dinks it over the kick. I mean, that's – and, and the, the reality is, whatever way you want to look at it, especially for middle-aged men, which I'm probably one of them now, the mentality, what we've had to overcome with Katie Taylor is 
firstly, this generation, which is women boxing, don't be daft. Like, you know, and that's the same Frank Warren said. Frank Warren now and Bob Aaron, they've actually had to promote a couple of women. It kills them because they're actually having to say now, blimey, it's actually people do want to watch it. Right. And then you've got my generation, which is like a little bit like, yeah, women's sport, but let's be honest, it's not very good, is it? And, you know, and then you've got the younger generation. I mean, my daughter plays football. She's 10. Now you see the success of the Euros. I cannot believe girls don't play football, mm. right? As part, as part of the, the sort of curriculum of, of PE activity. I mean, they will do now with this evolution of, of a, the success of the England team. But how mad to think that it was just, no, boys play football, women do a bit of netball. I mean, actually unbelievable to think we lived in a society. But I think that's I, I, where I, I think that's thinking. where the the I think that's where the men who were largely making those sorts of decisions s- didn't stop to say to the women involved in that world, what do you want? What 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 matters to you? And actually a lot of women would have turned around at that time and said meritocracy. The most important thing is that we're there on merit, not because we're a woman or you're a man, but because, and we used to have this the whole time at Sky with sort of that female sports presenter thing. It's like, no, you're either a presenter or you're not a presenter. And let's just do it on that. And either yeah. someone's better than the other person, but it doesn't have to be about what sex they are. And I think actually, Kate, if you ask Katie most women, they want to be in that scenario. The story of Katie Taylor, which is, you know, the little girl that used to walk into the doors of Bray, Women, girls boxing was banned in Ireland when she was boxing. Banned. It wasn't, oh, you can come along if you want. You weren't allowed. So she had to literally pretend. When she boxed as an amateur, she was Kay Taylor. She was a boy. And when she started achieving and, and boxing was being allowed on the international level for the amateurs, it was also not an Olympic sport, women's boxing. She campaigned for years to the IOC to allow female boxing to be part of the Olympics. No, 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 no. Eventually, the IOC said, look, I'll tell you what we'll do. Why don't you come and box in front of the IOC committee, right? Find another world-ranked opponent, or if you've even got any of those, we'll have a watch and we'll let you know what you think. She turned up with another one of the top amateurs. They had a three-round war and the Olympic committee went, oh my God, you're in. So people also don't understand she is also the reason that women's boxing is in the Olympics. I mean, her her legacy of achievements beyond actually, you know, the professional game is is unbelievable. And, you know, she's just a remarkable individual. When she sat in this chair here, I said, tell me, what, what's important in your life? Boxing and God. I was like, okay, anything else? No. And that is it. That is it. And, and it, she's just... I mean, she's, you know, she's mid thirties now and she's, the drive is still, you know, it's the same as it was when she was a seven or eight year old walking through the doors of, of Bray ABC. It's an incredible story, isn't it? Hey, Eddie, talking about the IOC, have you got any, any thoughts on this sort of nonsense with this chap Kremlev who's uh, taken on the IBA and banning the Ukrainians from taking part in competitions and so on. What, you know, what's going on there? Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that sounds I mean, like a shambles. I, I just think that, you know, that the professional and the amateur code is so disjointed. And now the amateurs have become almost like a commercial organisation as well. Now, the world championships that have just been, you was winning $100,000 for gold, $50,000 for silver and $25,000 for bronze. Now, that's away from your government funding as well. So, you know, the GB athletes, the GB podium squad fighters will be getting anywhere between 20 and 40,000 pounds a year tax free. But now they're introducing major financial um, prize pools for international tournaments. And actually, what they're trying to do is they're trying to stop the amateurs from turning professional, really. And now you're seeing amateurs who can turn professional, but also remain in an Olympic qualifying process. And now you've got the IOC and IEBA butting heads saying that boxing's out of the Olympics post-2024 in Paris if the, I, the IEBA management remain in place. It's, it's a right mess, to be honest with you. And actually, when you watch the Olympics, I mean, when I watched the Commonwealth Games, I went to the boxing at the Commonwealth Games. For me, it was the most um, 
exciting, entertaining sport or element of the Commonwealth Games, you know, up there with, with the athletics and everything. So I think there's a big place, actually, for boxing, even commercially in, in the amateur code. But it goes back to the problem now, which we said earlier, Ben, is that actually the amateur fighters now are thinking about funding, prize money, you know. And, and mm. when I watch the Commonwealth Games, they haven't touched that yet because that there isn't that element in the Commonwealth Games. And one thing I loved watch, watching the boxing in the Commonwealth Games was they weren't getting paid and there was no prize money. And they, they wanted to win so bad as a team. So you looked around at their teammates, whether it's Mozambique, Australia, GB, and all their teammates were in their tracksuits. Come on, come on, not come on. We're going to win a few quid if you win this. <laughs> Just win for our country and win for the medal. You know, again, when you were winning Olympic medals, it wasn't, of course, sponsorship and profile, but actually it was about winning. The, you know, the Olympic medal is something so powerful for that yeah. reason isn't it? Now the world yeah, championship so in boxing, the world championship medal was so powerful, but now it comes with a hundred thousand pounds and it's like, okay, so now you're creating a prize pool where one of the beauties of the Olympics is how powerful is the brand of the Olympics that the biggest names in sport want to win it so bad yet won't be paid for victory. So what? Are, what's the, I mean, what are they going to do from a governance perspective though to you know, to sort this out and keep boxing, it's got to stay Olympics. It'd be well, Olympic I think it, yeah, I mean, view. boxing really has to start. I mean, the, the the history and the legacy of boxing in the Olympics, I mean, going back to Floyd Mayweather, Roy Jones, you know, Riddy Bowe, Tophilio Stevenson. I mean, like so many unbelievable Sugar Ray Leonard, like so many great fighters have come through the Olympic system. It would be, it would be, you know, it would be, and everything starts from grassroots. So it kind of takes away a huge part of that grassroots element and hopefully they can sort it out. But it's hugely political, hugely political of, of people yeah, with extreme like wealth it. and power that want to take over, you know, an area of the sport. But Barry, you're yeah. not necessarily just going to sit there at your lake and fish, are you? I mean, there's got to be other things that are going to interest you along the way. Yeah, what about um, running for prime I, minister? Because we could do with somebody like you yeah. in political office these days. Do you know what? I, honestly, it's funny you say it, George. I mean, I'm too old now, 74, but... 20 years ago, yeah. I could have done a good job because I think I see a bit more of a balance. If I had the head I've got on me now and the energy and the drive perhaps in my 40s and 50s, politics would not have been ruled out. But now it's, it's much too late. I just sit there like most people and criticise the ineptitude of people that tend to run It's not country. too late. Look at Joe but, Biden. <laughs> yeah, I looked oh, at him. That's one, that's one of the reasons why it's too late. <laughs> a lot of similarities, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not, dribb I'm not dribbling in my chair yet and going to sleep in front of the fire. I have a very active life and uh, I'm intending to live that for as long as I can. I don't take prisoners in anything I do, whether it's business or sport. And I, be I appreciate I'm going to get beat all the time. Um, I started playing for Essex over 70s because I wanted to get in the England team. And uh, funnily enough, this year, after a I've had a couple of good seasons, I got a letter. You'd like this. I got a letter from the... England versus England over 70s versus Australia over 70s tour. And I thought, oh, my God, my heart leapt. And it said, as a member of Essex over 70s, I wonder if you'd be kind enough to write the program notes. <laughs> so, you know, one minute your dreams are up there, next minute you're shattered. When he was playing in Essex over 70s, he was in the B team. Yeah. And he didn't team. tell anyone he was in the B team. Correct. But I also played in the A-team. and Because I played in the A-team, I don't expect – this is a man that was a really good cricketer and doesn't – he hasn't for Christmas I bought him a whole new cricket gear, but everything, and he hasn't put it on once this year. Bad organisation. Sport <laughs> is an integral part of our business, of course, but to understand our business, you also have to understand sport and the passion that goes on and the dreams that go on. And they don't stop when you're 40 bloody three. They still live when you're 70 bloody four. And the day it doesn't, stick me in the ground and turf it over and make sure my grave is 22 yards long. Well, here's a great idea. Why don't you two buy your own cricket team? You know, it's a <laughs> cricket just cricket taking off. You've got, you got, got, you got the latest. You've got the latest. You've got the football team. And it Get came. a cricket team. Yeah, but he, yeah. he bought a house and it came with East Hanningfield Cricket Club. Yeah. Right. Uh. And so, 
And they were devastated because they thought, oh, no, Barry Hearn's moving and he's just going to bin the ground off and use it for whatever. No, how wrong they were. Horses or whatever. How wrong they were. He's built them a new clubhouse. They can't believe it. <laughs> they've, got the, they've got the covers. They've got everything. We've got everything. And we're also attracting so many good players that we're only two divi- – this is a village green side. We are two divisions away from Premier League now. For the first time for 20 years, the President's eleven, which is my team, were beaten by East Anningfield Cricket Club this year because they're bloody Shocker. good. You know what? This is, this is worrying. Is, this is a whole new project. This is your new project, isn't it? This is no, what's happening I love, here. G- Georgia, I love projects. I love I projects. I know. <laughs> and there are so many out there. There's so many out there. My new project is Nine oh, Ball look, Pool. This is, this is about, you know, what? We're gonna, we've only got an hour. Listen, I don't care. <laughs> Georgia understands the rules. Baz is talking. This is about Nine Ball Pool is my next big project. Along that, we have our own foundation now for our family so we can do different things because God smiled on us and we can be we can be good people. So at the same time, the business remains the core of our interest, but there's lots of other things. I mean, bless her, my wife last year, she had a wonderful year. She bred the winner of the Ascot Gold Cup, the Dubai Gold Cup and the French and Ledger in one year. So wow. that's not such a bad success, wow. is it, as well? You, the, you're only limited by your own imagination. Don't worry about the age. One day the, the, the good Lord will decide when you've got to go. In the meantime, smash it up, give them hell, change the rules and have some fun. And that's not going to change. And, you know, he's a, he's a good replacement. When I go, I don't go. It's just Eddie saying the same words that I've told him about what to say over the years. It's gonna be there's gonna be a state <laughs> funeral right. when you go, Barry. That's what that'll be like. It'll be astonishing. No, no I hope it'll be a mixture, really, won't it? I hope there's a good party. I hope there's a good party. I hope they drink plenty of the booze. That we play the darts music, and that's you know we've all got nicknames and walk on music. I've got exit music. It's all in my wheel. Don't worry. I've arranged it much like our, 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 our beloved Queen. Organise their own. So, you know, Duke of Edinburgh organises his own. I'm I'm not at that level, but I've got a few tips for everybody. But you anyway, know, we just got we're just going to enjoy every day, aren't we? I mean, that's why should we not? We worked hard. We put in a bloody good shift, and we're going to make sure we enjoy every second. What and are your say, family? What are your family walk on names? What are your walk on names? Well, me, I always come into Carly Simon singing. Nobody does it better. What else would you expect? <laughs> Eddie, what about you? <laughs> I don't, I've lost the conversation at this point. <laughs> <laughs> walk on name. Yeah. You need Which a walk on name. You can't think of anything to say. Walk on name. Walk on name. Well, they call me Fast Car Eddie for some reason, other than boxing terms. But um, yeah, I don't know. That'll work. It'll be something. It'll be something. Um, It'll be so, something guys, work. so, guys, bearing in mind that this um, podcast is called Performance People, what we just like to do before we before we sign off and let you go is just for each of you to give us a really good tip that people can, and you've given loads already, but a really good tip that people can live by in order to perform better every day. So why don't we start with Eddie and then we'll leave the last word to Barry. <laughs> well, um, one thing that I'm a big believer in is short-term goals. And I think too many people have these big dreams and aspirations but aren't really willing to solve the immediate problems and, and get through the immediate hurdles. And, and that really comes down to keeping life as simple as possible. And by doing that, it's day by day. And it's ticking off boxes continuously day by day by day to get to where you want to be but i did hear something yesterday steve harvey i don't know if you've you've heard uh steve harvey the american he was a comedian now he's like an inspirational speaker it's a little bit on the religious side which we have faith not not to katie taylor levels but he was talking about when you when you work hard and you you almost call on that that moment whether that be from god or that moment you feel like you are you've worked for you have to stay with that faith and he called it staying on faith street and what he said and this was a bit too deep was you know you ask from that that favor or what you deserve from god you have to remain on that street to receive the package if you want and if you move off that street onto what he called i don't know boulevard well guess what he don't ship there so that's about staying with the process and believing what you do consistency absolute key 
Because if you work hard, you have ability, and you do the right things consistently, the reality is you can't actually fail. You need luck along the way. But how long that takes, and that reverts back to old Steve Harvey, which is you have to stay in that place. You have to stay committed to that journey for that action to take place. Once you derail, once you stop the consistency, once you stop working hard, it will fall away. And, and the moment that might just be in front of you misses out. And, and I think consistency is, is the big, big word because it's very difficult when you talk to people who might be struggling or, or haven't got the opportunities. How do you motivate that person and say, you know, and they might say, well, it's all right for you. You know, you had a rich dad or, you know, you've got a big business now or whatever. So how do you inspire them to actually stay with it? Now, when they think every door is closing, I don't have any opportunities, I can't do this, I didn't get in that team or you know, that business failed, just have to trust the process and stay consistent. You have to have ability. You have to have ability. You can't just work hard and, and hope that you're going to make it in any given field. But, but consistency plus talent plus hard work is, is an absolute surefire winner. Well, mine, mine's a lot shorter version. <laughs> thank, thank heavens, because I've got another meeting coming up <laughs> in my retirement. Uh, you can't ride a merry-go-round with one foot on the floor. That's the thing to remember. You're either on it or you're off it. If you're on it, you're on it with passion. That's the only other ingredient you need. When I come to work, if I take my pulse, my pulse beat is three or four beats higher than normal because I'm excited, because I have passion. And when I commit, like Eddie says, I commit 100%. If I fail, that's not a problem as long as I've given my best. The good Lord will sort everything else out. Generally, it works. But just remember that merry-go-round. Don't come and tell me you're tired. Don't tell me I haven't seen the kids. Don't tell me I haven't got the energy. You're either on it or you're off it. If you're off it, God bless. Enjoy your life. As you can, as you can see, the compassion, the fatherly compassion you could imagine. <laughs> there's, none. there's none. There's none. There's none. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. You know, just remember that merry-go-round. You want to be someone, you stay on it. I love the There's fact no you've retreat. got a meeting in There's retirement. No surrender. <laughs> yeah. I was, this you've, means got, every day. you've got 15 minutes. Just, just I'm to planning talk, to that, change that the world. That will literally be, he will come into my office and he'll go, how are you getting on? And I'll go, honestly, I just, prop like this, 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 prop, the, oh, pull yourself together. Get on with it. What's the matter with you? Are you on it or are you off it? And that's and that's why but that's yeah. why he's turned out to be one of the best operators in the world. If I come yes. in and put my arm around and say, son, I'm so sorry for you, boy. How can I help? If I do that, I destroy, I don't create. And I wanted to create something special and I'm very proud of him because I have. And he one day, he actually knows that, you know, deep down inside he knows Baz is still the main man. You're the best <laughs> project ever, thing, Eddie. Really, really. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not a proud son, but I'm a tremendous project. So. <laughs> Enjoy it on that merry-go-round. You've all, you've all, you've both been on it, so you know that merry-go-round. Been on it, off it, on, on it, off it. it. <laughs> yeah, but you're better off if you stay on it. But you had other things to do. You somehow found a husband. Somehow, you know, created yeah, wonderful children. I love it. this. You somehow found a husband yeah. business. And now you've got a performance pod people podcast that sounds like PPP. Well done, done, you two. It's uh, it's a pleasure to see you both looking so chill. Whereabouts are you talking to us from? Oh, this is our kitchen. (laughs) In where? (laughs) That's our fireplace in Wimbledon. No, oh, you're in Wimbledon. Wimbledon. Yeah, we're in Wimbledon. So maybe one day, well, we'll we'll see you in the Caribbean one day, I'm sure. Look after yourself and go. Don't don't sink that boat, mate. Be good. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Yeah, really thank appreciate you. it. Know how busy you are. Thank you very much. Good luck with everything. Great Go pleasure. Right. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Bye. So we're at that time again. We've got to wrap this thing up. But I mean, that was. I mean, the thing for me that really came across was the passion. Yeah. Both from from Eddie and, and Barry. I mean, what a life he's lived. But from both of them, you know, just the stable of athletes that they've brought through, sports people they've brought through, how much they care about them, not just from a business perspective, but actually the individuals and some really, really 
um, telling stories that have come, come they, they talked about there that were very powerful. Yeah, I mean, how much as an athlete would you want one of them looking after you? I mean, the, the, like you say, the emotional connection that they must have with their clients, certainly with Katie Taylor and her brother tweeting Eddie to say, please represent my sister, <laughs> masquerading as the sister. Um, no wonder, because, you know, what a great team they're going to be, you know, as they, as they move female boxing, you know, through the stratosphere. Um, thank you for listening or watching to today's uh, podcast. We are Ben and Georgie Ainsley, and this has been Performance People. And uh, remember, from what we've learned today, set short-term goals.